Park. It's basically a watchdog organization of Mountain National Forest. We basically look at U.S. Forest Service land as well as Bureau of Land Management land. And today we're going to be at a, a Bureau of Land Management land. And um, what we do is basically we um, go out once a month um, on these hikes and let people aware of projects that are happening on BLM land and U.S. Forest Service land. But we also do, uh, from time to time, we do ground troofing where we go out to these project areas and we kind of look for certain things like certain successes plants or anything that the, that, uh, that the Forest Service might not have caught on these projects. Like for example, on this hike here, uh, we went out with a bunch of AmeriCorps people and we discovered uh, Oregon Slender Salamanders, which the environmental assessment of the timber cell didn't notice, and I'll get into the timber cell um, in a second. But, and so that's bringing on another thing that we do is basically that we review environmental assessments, environmental impact statements of these projects and comments on them. And if we see something that we don't like in these projects, we uh, basically you know, take the Forest Service or BLM to court, which is we actually have a lawsuit on this one timber cell that's out here. Um, so, and I get to that lawsuit in a second. But right now, uh, this is the Moa River right behind me here. And um, it provides drinking water for both the city of Malala and the city of Canby. Uh, the headwaters is up in the Table Rock Wilderness, and according to Bill right now, um, he's the president of Malala River Watch, uh, the, the flows are uh, coming down very high today from all the snow melt from the Table Rock Wilderness from our 1973 day yesterday. Um, another a little, louder. a little bit louder, okay. Um, one of the other things is, uh, especially with the Mala River, is that there's no dams on it at all. It's one of the dam-free rivers um, in Oregon, which if you've gone around, there's a lot of rivers around in Oregon, there's a lot of dams on it. Um, and then, basically, in this area that we're in right now, it's called the Mala River Recreation uh, Corridor. Um, back in 1992, um, is that the right date? Uh, the force, the Bureau of Land Management purchased this area from uh, Cabaham Forest Industry. And the community at the time came out and saying, hey, we want to make this into a recreation area. 
And so they worked with BLM and making distance to the Mall River Recreation Corridor where they end up closing 13 miles of uh, forest roads in this area and turning them into hiking, mountain biking, and equestrian trails. But they also created uh, 12 miles of new single track trails uh, for that recreational use as well. Um, about 8,000 people that come out to this area each year, and half of those um, go out along these hiking trails. And the community people out here also come out here and they monitor, these, or they maintain these trails monthly and work on them. And Phyllis is out here yesterday doing a, a change log training, and where they basically uh, train people to do change saws and about how to use a change saw and basically go around and, and cut um, trees that have fallen down on trails and everything. Um, but also one other thing to point out is that when they made this area into the Mall River Recreation Corridor, the BLM told the community that we're going to come back and log this area after they built the trail, made this whole trail system and everything. And they're now doing that right now with this proposed project called the Annie's Cabin Timber Cell Project. It's a 566-acre timber cell project, and they'll be basically logging up against the trails with no buffers at all. Um, there was a compromise that the BLM did about helicoptering some of the trees and removing some of the stumps near the trails, but it, it still is going to greatly impact the scenery of the trails. And as you kind of see later on in the hike, there's going to be um, they're logging mass amounts of the trees. And so there's going to be really hardly any trees left. Plus, they're saying that they're only out here to log 50 to 100 acres of trees. Um, but there, some of the trees that are marked to be cut are actually older than 100 years old. And so Mark has a lawsuit right now against the Bureau of Land Management over this timber cell, which we'll talk more about the details of the lawsuit later uh, on what certain things that we'll be uh, suing or taking to court, federal, federal court to be able BLM. And those are some of our supporters that just drove by. And um, <laughs> so, yeah, and so the court will likely be in either late June or early J July. Um, and one of our attorneys is here today, in, um, Andrew, who's working on the case. Um, and we also have another attorney, Aaron Madden, who's not here today. Um, so anyway, um, just get people moving. Um, we're going to go hike over to Sh uh, Shotgun Creek. There's a waterfall called Sh uh, Shotgun Falls. It's a perennial creek. Um, there's, it's a fish bear because of the waterfall that the salmon that comes along the stream can't get past that waterfall. But up above the waterfall, there's some um, resident cutthroat trout that's in that area. But if you look right up above that hill right up there, um, is that's unit nine, right up that hill there, and where they're planning to cut down the trees. So all those trees up on that hill there are gonna be cut. And then when you get to the waterfall, right above that waterfall is gonna be unit 12, and they're basically logging right up against the creek um, without, like probably, I would say the buffer is probably about 100 feet or so, but, um, but there'd be logging within that watershed of that creek. Um, if you go further back from that creek, you get into um, private land, which I believe it might be warehouser land, I'm not sure, but it's all clear cut. And, and they just left this little strip of buffer around, this, around the creek, but it's just the creek has already been greatly disturbed by private uh, timber harvesting. Looking at the size of the group, um, I was trying to think whether to split the group in, in half because it's kind of narrow back there and then like one half stays while the other goes in real quick and look at it and then the other half comes back and that might be a good thing to do.
Uh-huh. How high is that? About 100 feet? Um, yeah, pretty much close to 100 feet, I would say. And unit number 12 is just above this waterfall as well as unit number 9. How big are those units going to be? Um, right top of my head, I don't know the, the actual... They, they're going to log right up to the creek then? They're going to uh, log near the creek, yes. And so both of those units fall within the watershed of the creek, and they're only like I would say probably about like 100 feet away from the creek itself. And so that's part of your lawsuit is the proximity to the creek. Yes, it's our cumulative effects of um, just the past, uh, present, and future foreseeable impacts to the water quality of this creek and other creeks within the Mall River Recreation Corridor. Mm -hmm. This rock formation right here is called the Col columnar rosette, and it's basically a lava was flowing, and when it was cooling, it fractured into these little like stick of straws, and, um, and that's what you're seeing down here right now. It cooled because it hit water, or it just cool? It's just kind of cool, and it fractures as it cools. We basically walked up this old forest road here. Creek uh -huh. So we're down here on this uh, map right now. Okay. This right here is uh, showing the individual uh, timber cell units. We, uh, so this is where we are right here, right? This is that. We're just like 
down this area right now. And there's these two units here. So those two units are where? Up in that hill? They're further down the Huckleberry Trail. Oh. Um, but we're right now in this general area here. We're going to walk out into the end of these trails out in there? We're going to walk around um, Wetlands Trail oh, in, great. in a moment. I want to introduce uh, Bill Taylor here. He's, with the, he's the president of the Mala River Watch, and he has been working on a lot of these trails in this area. Um, and you can feel free to ask him questions as well um, about the trails. I'll just give you a brief uh, history of this area. This uh, area right in here, relatively small area, uh, was acquired a couple of years after the land swap with the BLM in Cavanham. Uh, private landowner, timber owner, uh, owned this small section of land up here. And I think it was about 94 that uh, the BLM did a trade with him to acquire this area. Um, the BLM ornithologists or biologists were observing uh, a pair of nesting golden eagles from uh, another little shelter just on a point up here. And uh, so that's where the name of this area came from, Aquia Vista. Aquia is uh, Spanish for eagle. BLM and Malala River Watch have uh, worked on developing, developing this site as a environmental study and research area. And uh, Malala River Watch organizes and provides mentors for field trips for middle school and high school students up here. And it's a very diverse area, it has uh, an area out here that was uh, clear cut about 20 years ago and is uh, coming back. There's also an 80 year old beautiful forest out here that we'll uh, see probably on, on your return loop. But there's a a wetland pond area out here and a couple of waterfalls that uh, come off the cliffs up here so it uh, just has a, a lot of diverse habitat and is a good study area. We'll uh, hike a wetland loop out here and uh, see some of these areas where we uh, bring our students. We uh, try to get enough mentors when we bring students up to split the students up into groups of 12 or less. Uh, usually try to keep it to about eight students per, per mentor. Sometimes we have two adult leaders per group and uh, we split into groups to study different topics such as plant identification, uh, tree identification and forestry, um, water studies, wetland studies, pond studies, soil studies. We've uh, taught map and compass and uh, we're uh, currently trying to uh, purchase some GPS units to add a GPS study to our curriculum and make it kind of a geocaching game where we uh, lead students to different points of interest and uh, they find the find the point with their GPS and then uh, learn something about the particular site uh, and then move move on to a different site so we're excited about developing that I think that's something the students will really like um, anyway are there any questions is this uh, area completed or do the students have opportunities to help build new trails or, or any of that? Yeah, there is uh, some ongoing trail work and the students in the past have had a big part in uh, working on the trails. Uh, the middle school students really like doing trail work, uh, clearing trails and uh, wheeling wheelbarrow loads of gravel. We've tried to make these trails up here ADA accessible. Uh, most of them are to a certain degree uh, pretty much ADA accessible. So the students have uh, in the past, uh, that trail work has been part of their educational component. Mm -hmm. So they've had a, a big hand in developing this and uh, I think that's important. They take some ownership in it and uh, when they're out in areas like this they'll feel a little bit more of a 
bond with, uh, with nature and the environment and take care of uh, areas like this, hopefully. Uh, why do you think um, that um, the timber companies insist on cutting in this area if they know that it has a high research value and a high like, public value? Um, well, I really don't know. Uh, um, there is a an older, beautiful forest out here that was originally on the original uh, BLM's thinning plans was included as a possible unit and the BLM did drop that uh, unit uh, early on, I think, at the insistence of the recreation directors and decided that that wasn't a, an appropriate place to, to do thinning. Um, but uh, Malala River Watch isn't opposed to timber thinning. We'd rather see thinning harvest than clear cut, uh, obviously. But uh, we are a little concerned about some of the areas that have high recreational impact. We don't think that they're suitable areas for timber harvest and should be left alone. Another group that's we've just been forming uh, is the Malala River Alliance. And Malala River Watch decided that to uh, have more clout and, and a little bit more say, maybe we needed to join with some other groups to try to help bring about some changes and add numbers. So Malala River Watch, the city of Malala, and the Malala CPO Community Planning Organization got together and formed an alliance and invited uh, a number of nonprofit groups, uh, government agencies, and private companies, private landowners, uh, anyone who had a stake in the area to join the alliance. And we've had one meeting uh, several weeks ago and have another one scheduled for Friday of this coming week. But we've had uh, real good success at. Uh, bringing other people in. We had 50 people at our last Alliance meeting uh, from all different uh, all different areas. NOAA, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, lots of uh, nonprofits. Uh, Warehouser was at our last meeting, uh, City of Malala, so um, we're really happy and we we're hoping to uh, bring about some changes up here. One thing that I would like to see is having this stretch of river that you drove up uh, declared uh, wild and scenic. It's eligible according to the BLM for wild and scenic recreation status. The Wild and Scenic Act has three different levels of protection in the recreation category would be the, the least protective, but uh, that would uh, bring a lot of attention to the river and maybe help us uh, bring about some important changes that we're hoping to, to accomplish. So you're saying that that alliance is a reaction to possibly the fact that, that the, uh, the BLM and, and the timber industry haven't been taking the values of recreation in the local community into enough consideration? Well, I think the BLM is interested in recreation and improvements, but uh, as a lot of other government fund agencies, they're underfunded and understaffed, and uh, we would just like to see them uh, have a little more emphasis on this area, give it more priority, and uh, hopefully make things happen faster. I think uh, some of their goals are uh, similar goals to what Malala River Watch has, but uh, we think that with a lot of help we can maybe bring in some more funding, grant money, and uh, and more people to work on this and just uh, make improvements and bring about changes uh, that uh, we'd all like to see. I'd like to just read two things whether uh, Malala River Alliance was born. Was born. One is to promote a climate that encourages tourism and healthy family recreation in the Mall River Recreation Corridor. A healthy and safe 
environment will naturally lead to an increase in tourism dollars to the area, creating jobs and improving the local economy. And the other point is to preserve the water quality of the Mall River and sustain the wildlife, fish, and plants that inhabit the Mall River watershed. And I wanted just to point out the Mall River trails maps here. Uh, these two maps here are more the northern part of the Mall River Recreation Corridor, so we're not on there, but a lot of the timber slow units uh, fall in these trails on these maps, on these northern section. But we're actually uh, down in this area right now in the Mall River Recreation Corridor. We were here earlier and we were seeing Sh Shotgun Creek Falls and down there somewhere in this area where we saw the Columnar Rosette and now we're over here here down here right now and so we'll be hiking around uh, this area Can you today. point out just generally where the timber sale is for people on that map that you were just putting your finger on? Um, well the timber sale is in this area here is one group of timber sales. Um, this map doesn't show the single track trails that the community built out here. These maps show the single track trails, but these show a lot of the decommissioned forest roads that were turned into recreational trails. Um, in this section here, there's a lot of uh, trails, especially uh, Rim Trail and Fern Creek Trail, which is really beautiful. Um, and there's a lot of timber cell units here. And um, Unit 8 is right here. Uh, unit 12 falls along this section of Shotgun Creek. Unit 9 falls right here. Unit 13 is over here. Unit 15. And then we'll be hiking through Unit 16 and 17 today, which is down in this area here. Hey Joe, are there still some, I know when the timber sale, when I was more, when I knew more about it a while back when they were first proposing it, there was also some along the southern sort of, yes. like, is that like the way south? They actually reduced it. It was a lot bigger. There's some units as well as Paul was pointing out in this section as well. Um, it, it's kind of off the map here, but it's in this area. And there's some also um, up in this area as well. Are there any? There used to be some this way. Are there still no, or no? No, that's over here. Okay, all right. It's in this area here. Okay. So all this area, there's unit uh, 23, 24, and 25 that falls in this area. Unit 18 falls up in this area here. Okay. So. so for folks at home that can't see it, can you run your finger along the uh, Malala River? The Malala River runs all the way down this corridor here. And I'm actually going up opposite from the current. <laughs> um, so I'm going pretty much upstream right now with my finger, but it goes all right up here into the Timber Rock Wilderness. So what we're talking about is, is uh, uh, timber sales on both sides of it, basically yeah. all the way down. The both whole sides of it all the way down. Um, and one of the things, there's I guess two things I would uh, want to also mention. One is that um, right out here is a Beaver Creek, uh, a Beaver Dam Pond that we'll be hiking around once we start going around the wet Wetlands Trail. And so I was just going to talk about it now, since um, so we don't have to stop along the way. Um, but I just it's kind of interesting to see because one of the things when we were passing up here, there's like a culvert and there's a lot of water behind that culvert. And one of the, well, there's two reasons why beavers create dams. One is that they don't like the ripple sound of the culvert noise, and so they try to stop that sound by um, building a dam right around the culvert. And the other reason is for protection from coyotes and bobcats. And so there's uh, a beaver's um, lodge back there that looks like kind of like a, a igloo of sticks. And it basically, you know, swims in you know water and, and swims up in that lodge, and that way, no bobcats and coyotes can't get it. So it, it creates a dam for that protection. And beaver dams are pretty good because it um, it does a lot of good things for the environment. One is doing uh, flood control. The other is um, preventing bank erosion, and slowing the amount of water that's going down the stream. The other is nutrient re removal. There's bacteria that forms on twigs um, that um, absorbs the phosphorus and nitrogen in the water. And the other thing is also, um, it's good for frogs too um, when they're laying eggs. So just to um, create some good puddles for frogs so they can raise their tadpoles and everything. Um, I guess another thing t to mention is um, in this area around Wetlands Trail, we'll be seeing a lot of red alder and, and some red osher dogwood and some currant and some big leaf maples, and I'll try to point them out along the way. And eventually we'll make it into Unit 17, then Unit 16. And once we get into those units, we'll start seeing a lot more duck firs. And the 
trees that are marked in blue are the ones that they're marking for to cut. beaver dams right now. The beaver built this dam primarily just for protection of its lodge. It's an <laughs> and, <laughs> and yeah, from predators just as coyotes and bobcats. And so that's what we're seeing right now is the uh, beaver dam. This is a big leaf maple here, which is pretty large. It's kind of um, at the end towards of its life, but it's a really remarkable tree right here. Um, as of right now, we just went through a lot of um, red alder which are nitrogen fixtures trees. They have this bacteria called branchia that um, grows, it comes in through the root hairs of the red alders and it, it basically uh, absorbs all the nitrogen in the air and puts it down into the soil. So they're usually like the first growth you usually wow. see after they uh, log the trees. So usually it's first like red alders, then duck firs, and then the last tree after that is uh, western hemlocks um, in, out in this type of area. And so once we start moving down this drill, we're going to start entering in Unit 17, which is going to be all dug first. So you can see what, um, this is like right after logging. So you kind of see um, what it looks like um, before they log um, with the dug fir growing. But that area also has been logged a long time ago in the past, and it's now just recently being recovered. Um, I also want to mention a couple other things. The name of the timber cell is called Annie's Cabin. And that name came from, um, a couple of BLM, BLM volunteers in the early 90s. Uh, his name was Jim Williams and he has a wife named Annie Miller and they had a cabin um, out near Unit 6, ju uh, just right directly next to Unit 6. And they lived in that cabin, they also lived in a trailer uh, parked outside of the cabin and they came out here and, and volunteered and they preserved a lot of the area. Right now, um, as well as people catch up, I guess I want to speak a little bit, but right now we're standing on the Huckleberry Trail. It used to be a trail um, used by the Mall Native Americans to go down to Table Rock Wilderness uh, to go huckleberry picking. And they later, I guess, turned this trail into a forest road when it was private land, and now it's a closed road for hiking, mountain biking, and horseback riding. 
Um, one of the things I just wanted to point out is that there's a thing called like what we call coarse woody debris and it's kind of like an old tree that is like down on the ground uh, that's been rotting for over the years and there's um, a very special creature that lives inside of it called the Oregon Slender Salamander. It's on the Bureau of Land Management, U.S. Forest Service, and State of Oregon's Sensitive Species list. And it lives in this course weed debris that's over 20 inches in diameter, basically its whole life. It never uh, ventures out, probably if it does, only about one meter away from um, the course weed debris. And it's one of those interesting type of salamanders because it has no type of larva stage. It just comes out as a full adult from its eggs. The eggs are inside the, the, the logs. and they basically eat the centipedes and snails in the log and we found them um, and we found three in unit nine of this timber of the Annie's cabin timber cell and we also found three in unit 13. The BLM also found some in this unit, I'm not sure where in unit 17, but also the unit that we're about to bushwhack to unit number 16, they uh, found them there as well. And so I have some pictures here of the Oregon Slender Salamander and I can pass this around if people are kind of curious what they look like. On the other side is um, a creature called the um, Red Tree Vole and this was also uh, found in the Andes Cabin Timber Cell. It's on the um, U.S. Forest Service and BLM's sur survey and managed list and they're very significant species because they're 50% of the diet of the Northern Spotted Owl. And they're the only uh, foal that basically lives up in the canopies and the trees because most foals live on the ground. And they found three nests and they end up canceling. Um, they have to do a 10 acre buffer around these trees where they find it. So they end up canceling certain portions of units, about 10 acres of the units, where they found a red tree vole's nest. And they're interesting species because they basically they go up and they build up a nest up in the high in the duck fir tree, about 100 feet up. Sometimes they use existing bird nests and just build off of those. And they live up there. Sometimes they venture down to the ground. They're nocturnal, if I didn't say that already. And they eat the uh, D Douglas fir needles. They uh, peel off the resin duck and eat the insides of the Douglas fir needles. And they also get their water from the droplets that just stay on the fir needles. And that's how they get their water. Um, so those are a couple of things I just wanted to point out in this section before we start um, bushwhacking um, to get to unit 16. Um, do anyone have any questions at all? down woody material at risk of a timber sale? Of course, it's at risk because when they bring in logging equipment, um, it, the ground disturbance from the equipment um, could destroy the coarse woody debris, as well as um, just basically them hauling their equipment in, their track harvesters to cut the trees could, um, if, if it's in their way, they can move it, pull over it, destroy it. I don't, that, that's one of the concerns. The other concern is that they're going to be opening up the trees. And it, the salamanders depend on those trees for moisture inside of it, but when they open up the canopy, it's going to make it drier inside for, for, and it's not so friendly for the salamander. Um, if the if we lose the lawsuit this coming summer, I'm hoping to work out something with the BLM though where we can actually transplant those salamanders somewhere else so they won't get disturbed. Um, but those um, are the two things, it's just the ground disturbance from the logging. Another thing is the trees falling onto the onto the course where you debris, breaking it open and everything. It's because it's it's not it's been rotting so much over the years, it's not that firm anymore. It, it, it's, you can easily just break it. If a tree falls on it, it'll just break open. The Oregon Center Salamanders is on a census species list, uh, which there's two lists where you get like protections. And um, one is the endangered threatened species list, and the other is the um, survey and manage list. The sensitive species list is more of a thing where they do study of the analysis of how many are there and trying to determine are they about to become a threatened species or not. And then they're kind of selective of where they put the protections. In some places they decide to put protections on the salamander, but in this area they decide not to put protections on the Oregon Center salamander. And the salamander only can be found on the west side of the Cascades from the uh, Columbia River Gorge down to Lane County where Eugene is. And that's just the area where it is. And within those two areas there's actually two different um, subspecies. There's the Columbia Gorge species and the Salem species. 
And the species that live out here, I don't know if it's either the Columbia Gorge or Salem or totally brand new subspecies, which would be awesome. I don't care where my money comes from. I don't care who gets burned. I don't believe in the unions. I get mine, I don't care about yours. I'm a true American. And I believe in baseball games. I'm a true American. And this country so Channels for comfort. I need the third world to bleed for me. I need plastic package poison food. I need a strong economy that's good. I need a gun that fires rapidly. In case the UN comes looking for me, I'm a true American and I need to believe. I'm a true American and I need to believe. to bid on projects right now because gas prices are so high. So, so helicopter logging is really not a very viable way to get an area logged. So we're always like psyched to see helicopter logging come up now. Um, but one of the um, issues is that the rest of the area is going to be ground logged or skyline logging, which is basically where they'll put at the highest point close to the timber sale, they'll have uh, chains pulling up the logs as they log them down below to a yard to a holding area up on the top if that makes sense. Um, Mountain National Forest, which we're not in the National Forest but we're nearby, it has over 4,000 miles of documented roads so it's a major road system and a lot of those were built in the 50s when they were logging really heavily and they were built very quickly and not and they were meant to be temporary roads. Um, so they're starting to fall apart. They don't have the money to maintain them, and the only roads they ever fix are ones that they're trying to get into log. Or if a road is blocking access for recreation, usually after a few years they'll go in and fix them. But they don't have the money to fix them, so it's often like a emergency thing where they're trying to get money as fast as they can, and sometimes it can take years. So um, I guess I was just going to point out, like. You know, Joe's been telling me about this crossing for a while, and I haven't seen it, but this is a classic example of um, a road failing and really potentially having an impact on the stream. The road bed, the actual like surface on the road, it's grown over enough, so that's that's good. But a lot of the times when these blowouts happen, you still have gravel or pavement that is, if the road is still being used, it's very easy for chemicals from the road surface to get, be getting into the stream system. Um, I mean, the culvert down there is supposed, I, I assume, actually, maybe, Bill, you know, is that the culvert that was supposed to be facilitating the stream? I mean, there wasn't another one. So it's pretty hard to imagine that that this stream is successfully going to be able to handle, or that culvert's going to be able to handle this stream. Um, yeah, I mean, we see that a lot, and we even have seen them, re, you know, redoing roads and not replacing the culvert because that is a pretty cost costly thing to do up front. Um, we, we try to make the point that actually it's a pretty good investment to make because you're not going to have things like this happening down the road. Um, other issues that can happen, again, it doesn't look like this road is being used, but, if, but where we see examples of these happening, um, invasive species can come in on the wheel treads of the cars, so roads are really common places to find the worst cases of uh, non-native invasive species, which can really mess up the forest ecosystem. 
Um, and then the biggest issue, and actually I just got back from this really interesting conference in Washington where they were talking about this, but um, one of the biggest threats to the hydrology in this region is sediment coming down from the road. And it's, I mean, it's easy to see the amount of sed sediment that's being sent down the stream um, that wouldn't necessarily be happening if this road wasn't here or if there was a better crossing, like a bridge or something for the stream. Um, there's a lot of other kind of, I mean, there's other issues that come with it. Those are the major ones that we've been really kind of showing people. So this is just a great example of it. Um, yeah. It's really ironic. There's not even a trickle of water coming out of the culvert. Yeah. The way that a road is built is it often, you, the cheapest way is you cut into the side of the slope and then you use whatever you cut into the side of the slope as your fill coming off of the rest of the slope, which is called cut and fill. Um, and within that engineering, the road is usually tilted into the slope, so any water that's falling on the road, because of course you lose your canopy cover, so there's a lot more water precipitation coming down onto a road than into a forest floor. So the water comes down, hits the um, the road bed, and then you, what you want to do is be able to manage the water so that it's not, if the road was tipped towards the slope, you'd have lots more water coming down, so it's often tipped into the slope, and then you have a ditch along the side of the road. And normally, um, the way that they handle the water that's in that ditch is through what's called a ditch relief culvert. So what you would have is a separate culvert to the side of the stream, where the water that's coming off of the road goes through the culvert, and then comes out and basically goes into the ground, and the ground acts as filtration before the water meets up with the stream. And what we see happening all the time, I mean so much, they don't put those ditch relief culverts in. Instead, they just lead the ditch right to the stream, and then the water goes right into the, directly into the stream and through the you know, stream's culvert, and that's how, and that is made, that causes major, major problems on the road. So, it's not very easy to go meet with the Forest Service and say you need to put in a whole new culvert, but ultimately that's what they have to start doing if they're not going to rip the roads out entirely. I came out here a year ago and saw this washed out road, and this alder tree that's it's just right here uh, was actually standing up right next to this forest road, but now, um, just recently, I guess this past winter, it also got washed out and, and fell down, so it's kind of interesting how, to see how the dynamic of this area has changed uh, really quickly over the year. And the steepness of this wasn't that steep either as last year. And it looks like if you have waterproof uh, shoes, I, I recommend hiking over across this and looking at it the other side because it wasn't as steep as that as before. It looks like it's now gained like 10 feet versus it was like 5 feet before. So there's been a lot of major um, erosion that has been occurring in, in the past year. not to log until the uh, litigation is over, um, which is pretty, he doesn't usually do that. I think that has more to do with timber prices than his actual like commitment to public process. But That's an Oregon company. Like this. It is, yeah. So we're hiking through here, it's unit 16, it's a uh, different unit than 17 that we were hiking through earlier. So Are they like, adjacent to one another? They're adjacent right next, next to each other, but there's an area that we just hiked through where it's just all, it was previously clear cut and now there's all those red altars that are growing. Mm. And so you can see, that's a kind of what dividing those two units. And so we just went from a patch of, you know, dug firs to red alders now to another unit, which is all dug firs again. So, but there's, and some of these units, there's also a mixture of big leaf maples and they also mark those hardwoods to cut, which 
we have concerns because that's going to uh, reduce the diversity of the uh, forest. If they're going to cut down those big leaf maples that are mixing with the duck firs. So there's no no rules or regulations that uh, for them to consider the fact that areas been logged around them and to consider the, the cumulative effects of the logging in the area. Yes, that's one of our major uh, points on our lawsuit oh. is the cumulative <laughs> effects um, that they. One of the things is that they need to do is consider the impacts of past, present, and future logging in the areas and other types of things such as mining and, and grazing and livestock. And the environmental assessment didn't really go into that into full detail. And as I was mentioning earlier, there's private lands just to the west of us and those have been completely clear-cut it and the EA doesn't um, address the damage it's going to do to water quality, um, just you know, combining just this timber cell and th those clear cutting operations that are going on as well. And and Amy mentioned before about the noxious weeds. That's another issue that uh, of them coming in here with their trucks and bringing in invasive uh, species, just as holly and a scotch broom and. So those are another one of our points in our lawsuit is that as well. And I don't know, does Amy or Angie want to touch on anything else before we start hiking again? The biggest substantive claim we have is the aquatics, the problem, the issues with the aquatics. Um, and like I was just sort of explaining, if, um, if we are successful at showing that they have been negligent in following these laws around aquatics in this area, it actually could be a pretty big case um, because we've seen them really starting to get pretty lax on their um, the aquatic conservation strategy, which is where the litigation is based on. The, um, and so that actually could be a really big point if we are successful with that because they have a lot of timber sales right now that we're pretty sure they're um, pushing the envelope on aquatic conservation strategy in a way that we don't want to see them continuing to go in that direction, so. Uh, Warehousers, the other major landholder in this watershed here. Um, there's also some private smaller landholders, but Warehouser owns a lot of land up here outside the, the corridor, the BLM land, and their stands, many of them are reaching maturity now. They're expecting to increase their harvest considerably in the next 10 years. This area was cut really heavily in the 50s and 60s, uh, timber companies, so uh, there's going to be a lot more private uh, harvesting and uh, so that's part of that cumulative effect too. Uh, we would like to see the public lands, you know, cut back to provide a buffer, especially when um, most of the public lands are right along the river, and so if uh, you can maintain that buffer, that would help uh, with all the increased private harvesting. We were told that uh, there was a lawsuit that uh, forced the BLM to land their own sea lands, log their own sea lands to provide revenue for schools, um, and we found out later that this area is not ONC land, it's public domain. So because of that land swap, a lot of the area up here is ONC mm -hmm. lands, which uh, is, those lands are supposed to provide revenue to what? counties, but, uh, and some of the revenue from this sale would go to the county, but the percentage is, I think, half what it would be on ONC lands, so, um, and that lawsuit doesn't force them to increase their logging on public domain land, so we figure, I mean, we think that they kind of misrepresented, misrepresented their reasons for, uh, for doing this harvest here. Some will say you gotta get
it your case. 